Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is one of Germany's leading chefs, but he's certainly an unusual representative of his profession because, as one critic put it, he makes vegetables the star of his dishes. And here he is, Michel Hoffmann. Hello. Thank you very, very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. A great pleasure. Now, Michel Hoffmann's Michelin star restaurant Margot is located in the very heart of Berlin, right around the corner from the city's famous Brandenburg Gate. But the real secret of his success is perhaps the vegetable garden that he's created about an hour's drive outside the city. Michel Hoffmann talks a lot and he talks passionately about the ethics of food and its preparation. And I'm sure he's going to be a fascinating guest. Michel Hoffmann, I'd like to begin by going to the West German state of Hessen, by going to the small town of Dillenburg, where you were born, where you grew up. Uh, and I'd like you to tell me about your grandmother, the one who inspired your interest at, in a at a very early stage in cooking and in gardening. Ja, meine Großmutter war wirklich diejenige, die die Initialzündung dafür. My grandmother was definitely the person who sparked my interest in cooking. She was the one who took care of the family. She had a small garden, and she cooked for us every day with a lot of love. She harvested everything very carefully and canned the fruit. It was a lovely way to grow up. And as a young boy, I was always fascinated by what she was doing. She gave me so much, a sense of values and respect for food and for eating seasonal foods. So I always knew that I wanted to do something like that at some point, that I wanted to cook. And we're talking, well, this was at a very early age. How old were you at this stage? I spent a lot of time with my grandmother before I started school. I was about eight or nine when I decided what I wanted to do. That's interesting because uh, uh, there are people who call you a little bit of, in, in your business as a chef, people sometimes talk of you as a little bit of an outsider. And now I'm looking at the, uh, the eight-year-old Michael Hoffmann. The other boys were outside playing football or listening to pop music and you were in the garden, you were doing cooking. Were you an outsider as a boy? No, I wasn't an outsider really. But I didn't have any brothers or sisters. I was an only child. And I had a fairly sheltered childhood. I grew up in a small village of about a thousand people. I played soccer and did all sorts of things that interested me. But I always wanted to be in the kitchen when there was cooking. Or help bake the Christmas cookies, for example. <laughs> Those rituals were very important back then. They've fallen by the wayside a bit nowadays. But I'm really glad I grew up with that. We'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, about the values and the techniques in, in the kitchen that have been lost. Uh, let's go a little bit further in your career and geographically to another place, another, another, a smaller place even than Dillenburg. We're going to go to Dietzholztal. And you, you began to work in an inn, in a, in a restaurant there, under an old school uh, cook called Herr Weiser, yeah? Tell us about him. He was important for you. It was an inn. And Herr Weiser was the chef and owner. I was a trainee, the only cook. I had to do it all from start to finish. It was tough for me back then. But he was a very experienced chef. He'd worked all over the world, on board ships, everywhere. And then he ended up in that village, and he taught me the basics of how to cook. And he used to tell me, You've got to learn things properly. It's like the roots of a tree. The trunk of the tree, that's the path you'll take later as a chef. And the branches, those are the experiences you'll have out there in the world. He was a very wise person. His name was Herr Weiser, and that's what he was. He was very wise. One day there was a TV show about the world's best hotel, the Vierjahreszeiten Hotel, according to a financial magazine at the time. He told me to come over and take a look, and he said, one day you'll be chef at that hotel, and that's when you'll know you've succeeded. And that is precisely what happened. And a few years later, that's precisely what happened. Wonderful. Um, 
You're talking about rural Germany, you're talking about small town Germany, big town Germany, because you've got your restaurant in Berlin, you're mentioning Hamburg here. Uh, your wife, I saw, once described you as very German. Was she right? Ob ich sehr, also you are very German, said your wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also okay. Ich, well, maybe you could say that I'm very German in my ambition, my straightforward approach, that I work hard. Flies, I knew you were going to say that. Sehr Deutsch. Discipline. Yeah, discipline. Yeah. Yes, my, discipline. My, my, my heart, so my but my heart and my emotions, the things that I want to express, that probably has more in common with Southern Europe or the Mediterranean. I love the Italian mentality and the French mentality. But my roots are German, that's true. Okay, okay. You found your first impressions there from Michel Hoffmann. Very interesting stuff. Here's more. <laughs> This is unfamiliar territory for Michael Hoffmann. The celebrity chef takes part in a podium discussion during the Berlinale Film Festival series, Culinary Cinema. The topic, big city people who garden and the yearning to sow and reap. The 45-year-old cook is passionate about raising his own vegetables. He then serves them in his restaurant, Margot, not far from the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin an elegant atmosphere and fine cuisine with a star in the Guide Michelin and three chefs hats in Gomio. Michael Hoffmann has been cooking here since the year 2000. Since 2003, when he became not only the restaurant's chef but also its owner, he has radically developed his style. More vegetables, herbs and fruits. Less meat and fish. That's Michael Hoffmann's kitchen philosophy. Hoffmann was born in Dillenburg in the state of Hessen in 1967. His grandma taught him that cooking and gardening belong together. He learned homestyle cooking at an early age and rose rapidly in Germany's top restaurants. At the age of 29, he was the chef in the restaurant of Hamburg's five-star hotel, the Vier Jahreszeiten. Michael Hoffmann is an impassioned seeker. He experiments with ingredients and preparation methods, seasoning with ashes and making use of everything he can. He takes inspiration from his garden in the countryside outside Berlin. He bought it in 2010 and then stopped taking summer vacations elsewhere. The 200 different herbs and vegetables he harvests here end up on diner's plates in Margot. He turns much of the produce into preserves for the restaurant's winter menu. Michael Hoffmann's visiting card reads, Cook and Gardener. When it comes to fresh ingredients, no chef could be closer to the source. And today, he is our guest on Talking Germany, Michael Hoffmann. And Michel Hoffmann, some fascinating images from your childhood. We've talked a little bit about your fir the first phase of your career in the business. And now I want to talk about uh, somebody who's very important here in Germany, but well beyond Germany as well, a legend in the kitchen, Eckhard Witzigmann. Yeah? Cook of the century, I think he got that title at some stage. Yeah, probably well deserved. Tell us about the man and tell us about why he's so important for your career, effectively as a mentor for you. Back then, when I worked with him, Eckhard Witzigmann was something like a god on the cooking scene. He was a chef who was always the master of the situation, whatever was going on in the kitchen. Even the things he hadn't done himself personally, he was always totally in control. He could just see with his eyes if the meat was perfectly done, if the pigeon was perfectly cooked. That really happened once. But on sight, by looking. <laughs> yes, by sight. He once told me, get the pigeon out of the oven, it's done. And I said to him, no, it's not done yet. But he told me, get it out. 
And of course, the pigeon was perfect. He had just this amazing intuition when it came to the ingredients and the products and the cooking. He's the person who taught me the most. And not just fine dining, modern French cuisine, but also the basics. How to cook a typical German dish like lentils with spätzle, for example. Or a perfect salad from the garden. He could do all of that. And he had this amazing respect for the ingredients. So he was a wonderful mentor. But as a chef and a boss, he was quite strict. <laughs> he was also, of course, the person who brought French nouvelle cuisine from France to Germany. And that was very important because the Germans then, and you're part of this movement effectively, took French nouvelle cuisine and made something very specifically German out of it. That's a very important development. Damals, das war ja nun in den, uh, als er Back then, he'd just come back from one of his long stays in France. He came back to Germany in the mid-70s, started cooking, and of course it was all very French back then. And that continued through the 80s and well into the 90s. German chefs all thought France was the non plus ultra, the ultimate when it came to food. But that's changed nowadays. German chefs, and Germans more generally, have developed a bit more of a sense of pride, and not just the guilt we used to have. And we realized that we have our own traditions, our own dishes, and our own cuisine. And that shouldn't just be hidden away and ignored. We realized that we could modernize it and create something contemporary out of it. That's exactly what a lot of people, a lot of chefs are doing today, and that's a good thing. We're also going back to regional products, not just products from France. Products that grow here, fish from our own waters. That's a wonderful development, and it also goes back to Eckhard Witzigmann. He always told us chefs that we needed to pay attention to the landscape around us, to pay attention at local markets to see what's available here, and not just in France. But at the beginning, everything here was about French cuisine. And now it's interesting, because you teach at the École Supérieure de Cuisine Française, I hope the accent's more or less all right, which is a, pre a prestigious <coughs> academy in France, yeah? And you teach young French men and women, yeah? Uh, what, what do they make of that, a, a German teaching the French? And how good do they think German cuisine is? That came about because they teach German at the École Ferrandi. And we've always had student exchanges between Paris and Berlin. So that's how I ended up there. And I really enjoyed it. I could speak a bit of French, of course, and some English. But they also translated some for me. It was a wonderful chance for me to introduce German cuisine to Paris. To show the students there some German dishes and products and how we work with them here in Germany. It was all very interesting. And the French were very open to allow such a thing. To allow a German to enter the holy confines of French cuisine. <laughs> Great stuff. Now, you've talked, you've mentioned values and you've talked about how important ingredients are, the ingredients that go into food. One thing we're seeing these days is there are, you know, every six months there's a new food scare, a new food scandal, recently with horse meat, for example. Yeah? Uh, and it's partly because people want cheap food on their plates. I'd like to ask you, have people lost their respect for the food that they have on their plates? With these food scares and food scandals, I usually end up thinking it's forcing people to wake up, and that's a good thing. Unfortunately, that's still fairly uncommon. But there are some younger people today who are taking a different approach to food, who are thinking about where their products are coming from, who want to know what's on their plate, and who are more conscious of that. Okay. Um, 
In, in your job, actually, in, let's talk about your restaurant now. Well, p- part of it is perfectionism, getting it absolutely right. Another part of it is creativity. How do you get the right balance between those two? Always interests me, that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a super interesting question. Yes, that's a very interesting question and a tricky one. So where does my creativity come from? In part, it's that everything should be perfect. The team, that it all operates like a well-oiled machine. That's part of the German tradition of hard work and about teaching how it's done. My ideas and my creativity, that's also something I want to pass on to my staff. But outside of work, my creative side has to do with needing to learn how to create space for leisure, how to let go, how to take the time to go on a walk through town to a market. And then there's my garden and the inspiration I get from nature. I also get inspiration from just closing my eyes and listening to music. There's no surefire approach. I've always kept a culinary diary, and I often go back and leaf through those. But for me, I think the most important thing is learning to let go. To submerge myself in a different world, a hobby, a complete change of pace. Wonderful. I, lo- I love the idea of the culinary diary. Well, <laughs> great stuff. As, as, as we've seen, Michael Hoffmann loves to be in the kitchen, but he also loves to be in his garden, which is a passion he shares with a growing number of people here in Germany. A joy that grows every day. Millions of people. More than half of all Germans feel that they, too, boom when they garden. Their garden is their earthly paradise. My garden is my own bit of happiness. Framing it with a fence is good. A person loses himself in the universe too easily. He needs his own little corner. Gardening books, garden furniture, garden tools and plants. German businesses catering to gardeners have almost 16 billion euros in turnover a year. It seems everyone, young or old, rich or poor, has caught the gardening bug. Those who don't have their own land can rent it. For example, in Bonn, a 45 square meter plot for salad, vegetables and flowers can be leased all summer for 179 euros. The wide open spaces in miniature homegrown organic produce. Brigitte Gathman wants her children to know that food doesn't grow in packages in the supermarket. It's important to see how much work and time vegetables cost. The children will have a different attitude towards them. When you've put a lot of work into it, you don't throw a whole head of lettuce away just because of a few aphids or snails. Sixteen German cities already rent out garden plots, where 1,600 hobby gardeners dig and plant and harvest near home. It's a business model that's thriving. In Andernach am Rhein, gardens are creating jobs. Urban gardeners, some of them welfare recipients earning additional token payment, plant vegetables on public beds. Anyone can harvest here free of charge. The slogan here isn't no trespassing, but picking is permitted. We've created experience value in the parks. People tell me it's really fun to stroll through the parks in the evening and see how the cabbage is doing and whether the tomatoes are red yet. It benefits people directly. And as a side effect, people identify with the vegetable gardens and thus with their own city. Michelle Hoffman, I'm sure that you are not surprised by this trend of people, mainly from the city, getting out into the country, wanting to grow things. (laughs) That doesn't surprise me at all. I understand it, and I know what it's like. We live in the city, and of course we strive for perfection and creativity, and there's always some stress that goes along with that. So it's hard to get away from that. But sometimes I say, now I have to go out to my garden, which I've been doing for three years now. The garden grounds me in a true sense of the word. 
out there in my rubber boots. Uh, that's exactly what I need sometimes. Dirty fingers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, dirty fingers, walking through the rain, exactly. It makes me feel good no matter how tired I might be. It's a hobby, a change of pace, and more and more people want to do that. They want to know where their food is coming from, whether it's herbs, tomatoes, or a carrot. And maybe they feel a bit suspicious, too, about what's being sold in some grocery stores. They want to learn the things that you learned as an eight-year-old boy. Yeah? Let, um, we've got some pictures here yeah, of your garden which I think is, it's about an hour's drive outside Berlin, so down by Potsdam, as far as I know? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's near Potsdam. Okay, okay. Tell us what we're, what we're seeing here, Michel. We have in the garden a We've set up two time-lapse cameras that snap a picture every minute. We set that up on April the 1st and then left the cameras running all year. So you can see exactly what was happening in the garden and how the plants grew. It starts with the tiny tomato plant and then grows and ripens. How does nature develop? When does it rain? When does it snow? Do thieves come into the garden? <laughs> it was an experiment for the Berlinale and the Berlin Film Festival. For an entire year, and we want to keep doing it. We want to turn it into a garden documentary. Okay. Two things that people like you can use in a kitchen for flavoring are herbs and spices. You prefer herbs, as I understand it. Explain why for us. Well, that's in part because herbs are more local than spices. When you look at spices, you're going to where the spices come from, India and places like that, and that's great. But it's hard to grow spices here, even though some do grow here, of course. But my favorite are still the herbs. But we also create spices here out of our vegetables, the blossoms, the seeds, the pods, which we turn into our own spices. It's quite interesting. But in the winter, we also season with spices from India and other places like that. Okay. We've talked about France and we've talked about getting your fingers dirty. There's a, there's a wonderful term that, the, that, that's used in French, uh, in, in French cuisine and in French viniculture. It's terroir which describes the, the earth itself, but it describes the culture that goes into it. It describes the minerals and it describes the knowledge that is used. And you've now got this garden in Brandenburg, in the area around Berlin. Do you have regional culture, Brandenburg terroir, going into the way you cook? <laughs> yes, just like in winemaking, the soil and the climate make a difference. And that's the case here in Brandenburg too. We have two gardens. One garden has the system we just saw, with a very heavy soil that has a lot of clay in it. A five-minute drive away, we have another garden, with a very sandy soil. We experimented with growing the same radish variety in both places, and it makes an enormous difference. At some point, I started calling my vegetable menu my terroir menu. <laughs> yes, because you can taste the soil and the minerals. You could taste it if the vegetables were grown near the Atlantic in the salt air. That would be fascinating, but we don't have that here, unfortunately. You keep using the word vegetable, vegetable, vegetable. But, yeah, you avoid using the word, or there's a word you don't like, and that is vegetarian. It's, a, it's an ideology, you say. I understand. <laughs> we try not to use the word vegetarian in our garden or our kitchen, because the word has a negative connotation. The word vegetarian always seems to have something to do with renunciation somehow. Oh, that yeah. heavy, heavy, heavy German yeah. word, verzicht. Exactly, verzicht, renunciation. And that's not really what I'm about. When you're aware of what you're eating, and you eat a lot of vegetables, that's not about denial, that's about variety. I have much more variety in my dishes, a variety of flavors, textures, products, visual presentations, than I would have with fish and meat dishes. We also do prepare meat dishes, but we also want to know exactly where it's from. While we're talking, I must interrupt, because there is one question that I do want to ask. Meat. 
Yeah. It's become a complicated question, a controversial question. How much meat should I be eating? Also, das Fleisch hat zwar sicherlich schon irgendwo seine Well, meat has its place, of course. But I want to know, where did the meat come from? Where was the animal raised? Was it healthy? And I'd like to eliminate some categories, like young animals, that were never given a chance to live any kind of life at all. Before, the idea was you have meat, and you have fish, and you have vegetables. In my kitchen, we have vegetables and herbs, and we have meat and fish. But the proportions have changed. Fish and meat are now side dishes. The Brandenburg Gate is a beautiful place. It gets very full these days. We're going to talk about it in just a second. But I want to come back to your book, Just in Taste, because we didn't. We need to talk about it. You need to just tell us, because this is a most remarkable book for people with sight, people who are blind. How did it come about and what did you learn? <clears throat> I learned an incredible amount working on that book. As a professional chef, at first I was a bit overwhelmed by the idea of cooking with a blind person. I was afraid and wasn't sure how I was going to go about it. But once I started working with the person, that fear went away. It was a very sensual experience, and I used my senses in a completely different way. We ate in the dark. It was a fascinating experience. I worked with the blind person and wrote out the recipes. Then I cooked them myself back at home. And sometimes I closed my eyes and thought to myself, okay, how can I figure out if the pan is hot enough? Can I smell the butter browning? Or can I hear that the pan is hot? I could put something into it. And is this how the beans sound and smell when they're simmering? I describe all that in the recipes down to the last detail. And then a blind person took the recipe and used it to cook the dish and gave me corrections or told me what worked and where I needed help, like maybe someone who can help him separate an egg. And that's how the book came about, and I think it's very useful both for blind and for sighted people. It's a wonderful project and it's a wonderful book. Great stuff. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the Brandenburg Gate. Yeah? The, uh, the location of your restaurant, you're just around the corner from the Brandenburg Gate, like 50 yards around the corner. Uh, is it a good location, a great location, or a problematic location? <laughs> <laughs> it's always been an extremely popular location. It's a wonderful address, of course. I'm sure that all of the people who visit the area had something to do with how well-known our restaurant has become. Nowadays, there's always something going on in the Brandenburg Gate. Demonstrations, sporting events, all sorts of things, just as we saw in that film. But all of that activity is getting to be a bit irritating. It's a bit too much. And of course, the location is getting a bit more expensive every year. So I don't think I'll stay there forever. Uh -huh. Interesting. Uh, you were talking about the people who come to your restaurant. Yeah? Where do they come from? Are they Berliners? Are they Germans? Are they New Yorkers? Are they... I've heard that there are a lot of people from New York and Tokyo at your restaurant. We've had times where about 90% of our guests spoke languages other than German. So they come from everywhere. 90%? That's a lot, yeah. Yes, but that has changed a bit. We have many guests from Germany, from German-speaking countries, and from Berlin. But we can't make a living just off of guests from Berlin. We depend on what's going on in the city culturally. Is a great conductor performing in the city. Then we get overnight visitors who go out and have a nice meal. <clears throat> so when there's a fantastic exhibition or some sort of cultural event, we do good business. Someone who lives and works in Tokyo and visits us here in Berlin brings an international perspective with them. And we have many guests from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, from Scandinavia. <laughs> And we have many young people on holiday, since Berlin is still a good value as a European city. And many guests from the US, from New York. 
Okay. And your restaurant is not astronomically expensive, but it's on the expensive side. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic restaurant and the food is fantastic, yeah, so it's justified. These people are paying big money, yeah, and traditionally people want to see, for big money, they want to see a piece of meat on their plate. And what you're offering them is, you know, the, the, it tends to be more vegetable, yeah? How are your big money guests responding to that? It's a bit of a challenge for them, maybe. It's not a problem because nobody can recreate what we do at home. It's way too much effort. It's not because the vegetables come from our own garden, but we're taking those vegetables and preparing them in a way that turns them into a real dish, something you eat with a knife and fork that has aroma and satisfies you. And that's much more labor-intensive than working with meat and fish. And of course, the guest is also paying for the craft, the art of what we do. Anyone can fry up a steak at home. You don't need to go to a restaurant for that. So charging 180 to 200 euros for a vegetable menu with the accompanying wines isn't a problem. Great stuff. Wonderful. Okay, there's, uh, the, I can tell you there's much more to Michel Hoffmann than simply making people supremely happy by serving them what might be the tastiest vegetables in the world. He's a very keen cyclist, for one, and uh, he's a photographer, too, which is why we're now going to talk about those wonderful old gadgets where you, uh, you went like this. You went click, and a photo came out at the bottom. A Polaroid camera, of course. We have this report. Open the hatch, insert the film. Kira and her friend Hannah are both 16 years old and they like how Polaroid photos look. They're one of a kind photos. Every shooting is a kind of happening. I love the suspense of waiting to see how the picture will turn out, what perspective it shows. I really like that. With a digital camera, you can always take a new picture. And with this, you capture the moment when you take the picture. The first instant picture camera was sold in 1948, and immense success followed. But 60 years later, Polaroid ceased production. Digital photography was faster, cheaper, and more practical. Then, in the nick of time, in 2008, the entrepreneur Florian Kapps rescued the last functioning Polaroid film works in Enschede, just over Germany's border in the Netherlands. He founded a new company that produces the old kind of film. More and more people, especially young people, are asking about Polaroid. So there's a surprising trend. Things are moving away from the traditional Polaroid photographers to a new generation that grew up with digital cameras. But it's now discovering this world of analog pictures anew. This year, Florian Kamps plans to sell a million units of Polaroid film. So it looks like this format, which was considered extinct, is still alive and kicking. The Polaroid photo was not just something for parties. It also interested artists like Andy Warhol, Helmut Newton, and Robert Mapplethorpe. An exhibition in Dusseldorf in the summer of 2012 showed the artistic side of the instant photo. Polaroids always looked a bit like art. A fascinating relic of a vanished era, not lot so long ago. Today you have to look at 400 vacation photos. That would never happen with Polaroids. Polaroids are unique and have an aesthetic all their own. And that's what Kira and Hannah find so interesting. For them, Polaroid photos aren't old-fashioned, but a new trend. Well, there you are. They're, they're a new trend, and uh, because they're a new trend, and because I learned that from that report, I brought my uh, my Polaroid camera along today. I dug it out, Michal, from a bottom drawer. It's a little bit dusty, yeah? Uh, the amazing thing with this camera is, after five years in a bottom drawer, if I press the button up here, the, the battery is still charged. There's a little red button here, yeah? <laughs> amazing. I can't believe it. It's a little bit dusty. Michal, is a bit, he's, a, he's a photographer. He's a bit of an expert about this kind of thing, yeah? Tell me about... I need a film. Yeah, tell me about the films. 
Ich habe ein paar alte Kamera, Polaroid Kameras von mir gekauft. I bought a few old Polaroid cameras. And of course, as we saw in the report, there's also that company. But I'm not completely satisfied with it yet. Maybe it has something to do with my technique, that the resolution isn't quite as good as it was back then. Band photographers are saying that the company doesn't quite have the secret recipe down for the film, not 100% yet. But it's a great deal of fun, and each photo is one of a kind. I love that, and I love that it's being revived. I'll definitely keep working and experimenting with it. Okay. I've promised my daughter when I got the camera out yesterday evening, I promised her that I would get a film. So I'm going to give it a try and I'll get back to you and I'll tell you what I think about it all. Uh, you have a photography project going at the moment. Tell me about it. Yeah, also einmal haben, wir haben also diesen well, we did that time-lapse film. That's one thing. We're also doing all sorts of things with cameras. I've made portraits of the vegetables for my garden. Last summer I took 140 different kinds of vegetables and took pictures of them at a spot in my garden with no light. The kinds of vegetables you don't see on the market. I just pull them out of the soil, set them down and take my picture. And I'm also planning my first exhibition, and I hope it'll be good. But my garden and my restaurant take a great deal of time, so I have to be patient. Garden, restaurant, photography, cycling, coming on talk shows, yeah. <laughs> uh, I am told you work 100 hours a week. I don't know if that's true, no, no. but somebody said, Michel Hoffmann, 100 hours a week, yeah. Uh, you work very hard, yeah. What keeps you going? That's a good question. Well, we're already pretty big. So everything that I do, the restaurant is big and we have a garden. We do a lot of canning with our produce. I'd like to start a small production facility for my garden, to make my restaurant a bit smaller. So instead of getting bigger, I'd like to get smaller. Less public, more exclusive and special. <laughs> it's hard if you keep getting bigger and expanding. It's hard to maintain that top quality and obtain top products. So I'm moving in exactly the opposite direction. Okay. I mean, one thing you could do, of course, is uh, you, you said that, you know, the Brandenburg Gate location has its problems. You could move your restaurant to the garden and have the Berliners coming out to you. That would be a possibility. Yeah? That's a lovely dream, but not easy in Berlin. Okay. We're going to have to leave it there. We're going to move on to our traditional Talking Germany quiz at the end of the programme. Yeah? First question. Do you prefer to be in the garden or in the kitchen? Momentan right now in my garden. <laughs> I thought you might say that. Uh, in the kitchen, discipline is very important. You mentioned it at the beginning. So are you a dictator or a Democrat? Democrat. A Democrat. Oh, I wonder what your employees say about that. Oh, but, uh, but, but I learned how to be that. <laughs> oh, good, OK. Uh, what's more important to you, trends or traditions? Traditions. traditions. Do you prefer cooking or eating? <laughs> ah. Cooking. Cooking. <laughs> Cooking, yeah, and eating. Yeah. <laughs> I am afraid that is all we have time for with Michael Hoffman, a man described as a great avant-garde chef. I'll buy into that. He's a great guest, that's for sure. You'll find more impressions uh, in my blog on the Talking Germany website. And if you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, then do come back next week. Until then, bye-bye and cheers. <laughs>